How do we really feel about private companies being involved in the NHS and general practice? Here at EGP Learning, we've noticed a theme in recent months and years even that uh, we're talking increasingly about private companies being involved in running GP practices and involved in the technology around that support primary care and general practice. We talk about it a lot, but we don't often talk about how we feel about it. So today, Gandhi and I are going to be exploring our own feelings and possibly you will contribute and comment and give us your thoughts and feelings as well on private involvement in general practice. Let's go. Hi, Gandhi, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Andy, yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Um, quite interested to talk about this topic this morning. It's one of those um, areas where people can have strong opinions, the involvement mm -hmm. in private companies uh, in the NHS and in general practice. Um, hopefully we won't offend anybody this morning. So just putting it out there that we know that there are strong emotions and feelings and opinions around this topic. Mm -hmm. And really what we're aiming to do today is stimulate uh, debate and discussion. Um, yeah, how are you feeling about tackling this topic, Andy? I think it's going to be emotive and interesting, as you mentioned, but also it's unusual. It's something that's not really talked about effectively. I don't think. I think you know it's one of those unspoken debates that happens in 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 you know healthcare and stuff. And actually, we probably need to talk about it a little bit more just to understand it more effectively and stuff. And hopefully, this will spark that conversation for everybody. We shall see. Yeah, yeah. So I think this morning, what I'm going to do for myself is really try and dial down the emotion and just kind of think about uh, think about the facts and um, and uh you did weigh up the pros and cons and try sort of try and get a little bit more clinical about it um and take all of that emotiveness uh, out of it this morning for myself um uh but but gandhi so how have we what have we been noticing recently i guess that's that's led us to want to have this talk today Just well so. i mean if we look at the recent trends there's definitely been a bit more of a push to private companies in particular being involved in healthcare and then specifically in general practice we covered that recently in our um, episode that we did the other week talking about you know the optum buyout of emis which is a major major thing in terms of general practice you know that one of the largest um, healthcare uh, record providers in the uk being bought out by an american company but actually that's not the first time anything like this has happened you know there's the operos takeover um, of AT medics that happened last year that made them effectively the largest uk general practice provider um, and we've had similar things happen across various different areas in general practice. You know, Babylon coming in is considered a, a private company and, and things. And, and that's been happening well before the pandemic and stuff. And, you know, other areas as well, you know, providers taking over practices and stuff. But I think it's important to remember that general practice itself is actually a private provider to the healthcare system, isn't it, Andy? Yeah, of course. So um, GPs elected when the NHS was formed in 1948 not to be um, nationalised and become mm -hmm. part of the NHS. And they remained as individual private uh, individuals operating as individuals and also groups of individuals operating as partnerships. So uh, general practice has always been a little bit different to the rest of the NHS in that uh, it is effectively privately owned. It often doesn't feel like that because it's mm -hmm. traditionally been very small organizations or individuals that have sort of felt and acted very much like they are part of the fabric of the NHS. But mm -hmm. in actual fact, uh, it's it sort of contracted out to those, those partnerships and those uh, individuals. And I would say, uh, having been in general practice for some time, uh, just like there's a range in the, the, the ethos and the attitude of um, non government organizations to things like profit and service um, and how to structure and do things. Uh, I see a range of sort of attitudes uh, on those spectrums in you know general practice itself, actually, mm -hmm. you know, no, no two GP partnerships uh, are the same. So we've always had that that private ownership and that variation. Um, does that have I represented that accurately, accurately, Gandhi or? Absolutely. I think a lot of it comes down to the ethos and, and the origins of the companies that are taking over. And I think that's probably the part we need to think about more when people talk about private healthcare you know we're talking about companies coming in and taking over practices rather than obviously um general practice um in terms of the independent contractor status has been partnerships running practices and stuff so it's individuals that are running the business rather than necessarily company and it's a slight distinction it's a semantic thing potentially and you know actually do we use the term independent contractor versus private company akin to you know how people would use the word i don't know Let, let's go controversial expatriates and you know um oh, i forgot the term the other one the equivalent one um, i i can't i'm not sure gandhi but you're mm. making a really good point because actually what we've had to this this point is that actually only partnerships can own gp yeah. can own can um 
can be commissioned to provide GP services using the traditional GP contracting methods. And you're right. So a partnership is different to um, a, a limited liability company in mm -hmm. a number of ways. And, you know, two big things come to mind. So first is partnerships uh, sort of track the ownership to individual people who work within the business. Yeah. Uh, whereas a company, uh, and I'm, here I'm talking about companies limited by shares, um, mm -hmm. actually tracks the ownership not to the people who are running the company, but to the shareholders. And mm -hmm. those people who are running the company and work within the company are beholden to the shareholders. So I think that's a big difference. Um, and the other difference that we talk about a lot is is, is liability as well. So within yeah. a partnership, those individual partners are liable for um the failure of the business you know if the business fails if that gp partnership fails and there are debts and there are liabilities within the organization those track back to the individual partners and their personal finances and they might have to sell their house or other things yeah. it's, it always sounds catastrophic and i worry that we put people off being partners when we talk about these things because it very you know rarely happens i've not actually heard of anyone selling their house to pay off liabilities in a gp partnership um so i have it has you happened have, in yeah. various places and the people are you know have gone bankrupt as a result of trying to keep their practices afloat and stuff and and personal um implications that it's had not just in terms of finance but also um health and well-being to be honest and, yeah. and that's probably the part we forget about so it is a risk absolutely yeah so i uh, will have heard of it. i've just never not had direct contact <laughs> with anyone mm -hmm. that it's happened to thankfully um so but obviously within a within a limited company if the company fails uh provided the directors have ran things correctly um then um actually it can wind up and actually um uh, those debts don't don't track back to the shareholders the owners mm -hmm. they they are not they are not liable uh, the directors can can really limit their liabilities um so actually there's much more opportunity to fail um mm -hmm. which has implications when you're talking about organizations that need to continue you know when there's healthcare that needs to be continued to deliver you know organizational failure can be a big problem um so um it was just important i think to dwell on on those differences because i think they are important absolutely and i think there's also that perception that when um you know certain types of private providers fail that the backup is that general practice takes it up again afterwards and whether there's an element of that that where maybe that's where some of the animosity comes to private providers that you know um it goes back to either general practice or goes back to the nhs in terms of you know that that's the default mechanism but actually if they've not been able to provide that service why then is another service is already doing the stuff you know doing the work and the backup option that without the additional resources potentially to understand why the first one didn't work or you know what was the reason for it not working and things i mean we're going to get into that in a second i'm probably jumping <laughs> ahead but just yeah, yeah. It's something that came to mind that you know that is that one of the things that goes to those perceptions of the private providers that because if they fail they can just walk away because of the limited liability whereas actually other parts of the healthcare system like general practice like hospital trusts and uh, well not trust but you know those kind of things can't yeah, absolutely. And uh, and what you'll find if you look at how the some some private companies set themselves up, they um they control risk by having mm -hmm. subsidiaries and separate companies owned by other companies uh, so that they can control the the risk of liabilities track tracking and cost tracking back up to parent companies mm -hmm. if if subsidiaries um go bust. So you'll often find it's a, you know, it's a, a UK based subsidiary or a company owned by another company that takes mm -hmm. something on. Um and that's because you know companies are used to setting things up so that they uh so that they can fail and not take down all of the parent company yeah. uh, whereas obviously if it's a partnership if it fails then you're being taken down um mm -hmm. so uh, in a second we're going to talk about some positives and, and negatives and try and provide a little bit of structure uh, there's a few more ways i think in which this debate is is muddy as well um yeah. uh, because um we're starting to get some new organizations which i think are blurring the lines between um general practice ownership and private companies and i guess i'm talking about federations really um yeah a lot of federations were set up. Um, these were, were the uh, saviour of general practice, I guess, before primary care networks came along mm -hmm. or ported by many to be. And a lot of areas set up GP federations. And a lot of those GP federations are set up as uh, companies limited by shares um, with often some provision for the share ownership to be held by GP practices, for example, or people who work locally within uh, the provision of general practice. But they mm -hmm. are more like companies, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, any thoughts on that federation structure, Gandhi, before we move on? Well, it's a developing section, and it's something that we're seeing more and more um, investment in some ways because it's providing an alternative resource, I think, for many primary care networks, which is the other kind of delivery model that we're now seeing. Obviously, some primary care networks are 
self-autonomous and able to do everything themselves, whereas other networks are massively relying on their local federations for that additional support and things. So understanding the concepts and the risk that comes with that. But then there's also that element of, you know, what we have seen in some places, federations taking over practices that are in either situations of challenge, succession, for whatever reasons, um, or other aspects. But then is the ownership of those then raising a deeper question that means that those federations may have to change to different models potentially in the future as well? I don't know. I think, it's I think so. There's, there's probably a whole, uh, the, the, gosh, we could talk for a whole episode on uh, on ownership structures yeah. of federations, I think, because there are so many uh, difficult um, questions uh, there um, and, and we don't necessarily have the answers yet. But yeah, GP federations kind of blurring blurring the lines um, a little bit, but definitely providing that scale to allow general yeah. practice to do, do more things that it needs to do at scale. Um, the other thing as well is, um, you know, socialized uh, industries don't always um, perform well or keep pace with private industry in terms of uh, innovation, um, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of service and so forth. Um, just sort of raising this point, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot more industries were uh, nationalized in the United Kingdom, I'm sure in other parts of the world uh, mm -hmm. in decades gone by. And uh, they were then privatized. I'm thinking of things like telecom. You know, so forth. Um, and many people will argue that um, the telecoms industry now uh, in its privatized form, you know, delivers better service and, and, and cost and value for money mm -hmm. than it may have been able to do you know, when it was nationalized. I think my parents talk about waiting two, more than two weeks, you know, possibly longer for their new phone line to be connected when they moved into their new house, you know, for example, and things happen much more quickly these days. Um, so um, it comes down uh, to that concept of who are you trying to serve, isn't it? So with the changes in terms of telecoms industry, rail industry, that kind of stuff, you know, there's the customer uh, and that concept, the customer is always right. Um, but also in terms of the potential that you need to have investment in order to drive growth for more customers and stuff. Yeah. What's interesting about the healthcare perspective, particularly in the UK, is growth is the one thing we're not really bothered about. And that's, I wonder where there's a, a complexity that is added to the private health, healthcare system coming into healthcare in the UK, because growth is not the problem that we have. It actually, it's service is the challenge. It's making sure you've got effective service because you don't need growth necessarily. It's an interesting it, complexity. Yeah, it's service and funding, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. Because uh, we have a, well, at the moment, we have a, a single, you know, a single purchaser model with the government as the sort of single purchaser of um, of services. And it doesn't look like we're moving away from that. You know, no one's mm -hmm. really talking about moving away from that model, but we are talking about increasing private company ownership. Um, you know, where there's a true privatized market, you know, money can mm -hmm. follow the activity. You know, people, I guess, at the end of the day, pay for what they use. And that's the case in the telecoms industry. And that's the case in the energy industry and the yeah. other kind of privatized national industries um, in the UK. Um, you know, that's how they operate and that's how they're able to um some might say be more responsive to the the customers because when they want something they have to pay yep. for it um and that's not what we're talking about at the moment in the nhs i'm not hearing any talk um of that and that's not what we're talking about today i think i think we're talking about private providers um yep. for services commissioned by the government um the other thing that just came to mind gandhi as well is that actually you know market regulators uh, are really important you know how the services are commissioned mm -hmm and the markets regulated we have quite heavily regulated utilities markets yeah. in the uk and you know that's something that we just need to remember when we're talking about oh, how well the private market serves the consumer well actually they're quite regulated markets and we have quite strong you could argue regulated. shows healthcare you know we've got organizations like healthwatch cqc obviously the gmc's in terms of delivery of healthcare it's massively regulated increasingly they're finding more and more organizations to regulate them as well so yeah yeah so maybe maybe you know uh a regulated uh, privatized uh, health market in the UK, you know, might be possible. I mean, who, who knows? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, let's um, let's see what else. Um, shall we start talking about some of the some of the positives and, yeah. and, and negatives that we brainstormed around this? And this may be where some people feel a little bit controversial. Those that have, you know, particular views and stuff, you know, may say, "Well, there's no positives of private companies coming in to manage general practice and help general practice in that way." Mm, actually, that's not true. So let's have a look at the positives, Andy. Yeah, so um, one thing. So we talked about the um, the takeover emis by um, uh, by uh, Optum Health uh, last week on the podcast. Link to the episode somewhere, I'm sure. Um, and we were getting some live comments from some of the people watching, and actually, some people were saying, "Well, you know, emis product is um, 
well, it's good. People like the image product, but they were saying, actually, sometimes it's slow. There are features there that we would mm -hmm. like to see that aren't there. There is often too much downtime when it doesn't work for us. Um, maybe private company will be able to provide some investment to actually invest in the infrastructure, invest in the products, deliver us um, mm -hmm. these, these services and features that we want and limit the downtime and make it more stable. Um, so actually, um, private companies um, can access investment that the government can't. You know, obviously the government can... Yeah sell government bonds it can use money from taxation to fund investment but private companies can borrow on capital markets they can issue shares there's issue bonds there's all sorts of things they can do to invest yeah and it's not just about the investments about the other resources those private companies may have as well you know look at for example like um, when google and apple buy other companies they often buy them because they want the ip that those companies have that they can then extract and export to other areas of their business to optimize or improve them or change the service levels and stuff and potentially you know larger companies coming in to do that may have the other resources in parts of their company or other knowledge for example to adapt and and you know integrate in other areas of the business like the one that they've just purchased so you know potentially um united health purchasing uh, emis may mean that they can use that and some of the other parts of their business to optimize it even further yeah, absolutely. You know, we often talk about doing things differently um, in healthcare, but we are all people who, uh, you know, work in a particular type of healthcare, you know, and have done so for a long time, talking together and actually bringing in voices and expertise and other sort of professionals from outside um, mm -hmm. might provide some improvements, you know, a lot of people would say. Um, I suppose the other thing, um, the other big thing uh, that people would talk about with, um, with private involvement is um, you know, that if you have a number of uh, private players, you know, uh, competing for contracts, um, yeah. that there should be some uh, market forces at play to um, improve the quality of the services delivered uh, you know, and the efficiency of those delivering the services. Um, yeah, that's what a lot of people would say. I mean, I guess what we've just identified is that the healthcare market in the UK might not be a truly efficient market, or we're yeah. not really talking about setting that up. So whether we fully achieve those advantages or or not, I, th I think is debatable you might just have a few you know big players you know chasing uh you know uh government uh organized contracts and then i don't know i'm not sure that we'll achieve true competition between players i don't know what do you think i think it's always going to be challenged we talked about the the financial structures and how that's different i think in terms of healthcare compared to other businesses and that's why i think it's always going to be a difficulty because of the single purchaser model that we have in terms of nhs but yeah I think market forces has some impact, but again, it comes down to service rather than necessarily finance, in my view. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. uh, one thing, this just vocalizing these things, it just made me think, I think at the start, we were going to say, we are not economists, we are not health economists, yeah, yeah. we are not, uh, we don't have um, business degrees. So we're, really, we're just GPs, you know, talking about what we think, hopefully sparking some, some debate in what we know is a controversial area. Um, another positive that people um, talk about um, with sort of private involvement is we, we hear this word economies of scale. And um, mm -hmm. we don't just hear this actually, you know, with private involvement, it's really sort of any scale. So actually primary care networks potentially could deliver some economies of scale, you know, uh, other collaborations um, across large population groups could achieve economies of scale. But people talk about companies and particularly large companies being well placed to um, deliver that economy of scale. You know, if you're looking after hundred thousand patients in one organization you can perhaps have a lighter mm -hmm. management structure you know per patient the cost of management could be less i don't mm -hmm. know whether it actually translates you know into that but that's that's the theory and that's what private yeah. companies try to achieve i guess but it does vary i mean we talk about you know how um in general practice the economies of scale that you may have so for example having document workflow systems and, and staff that can work across multiple practices rather than individual practices and you know um purchasing systems um accountancy software various things that actually each practice is having to invest in itself but then you can adapt to cover large areas and therefore that's where you get the economies of scale i might need to remember so we the other episode we talked about obviously the operos issue in terms of the um uh what do you call it physicians uh, associates no the panorama investigation yes. and i remember watching that episode one of the things they pointed out was there was something like a thousand documents that um the operas practices hadn't filed um um in that episode now important to remember that the operas practices cover massive population i think it's something like oh, i forgot the number 30 to fifty thousand. Uh, it's a huge number of patients but actually when you can down the um a thousand documents 
there was a really small number of patients in comparison to their overall list size. Now, if that was information about the entire Opro's network, that'd be a really small amount for their daily workflow, actually, compared to an average, you know, an average practice will, you know, my practice is 10,000 patients. We get easily good 200 letters every single day coming to us that need to be filed on a daily basis, you know. It's important to remember when you come to those economies of scale, you're going to deal with much larger numbers. But you need systems and, and kind of organizations and teams to run that then. And you can share that across. So I, I don't know. I'm trying to make a point. Yeah. I don't know. If, you can have, you can, if you've got a lot, large population, the larger population, again, you can have specialist teams that, you know, specialize, get really good at individual tasks like document mm-hmm. filing, as you're saying, or, you know, results processing. Yeah. Um, and in theory, that allows you to be more effective, more efficient, um, and do more with fewer people because people are specializing. And that's, I guess, economies of scale. Don't need to be companies to do that. You know, federations can help practice achieve economies of scale, yeah. but, but companies, you know, would say that they're particularly good at economies of scale. Um, I suppose the other thing, which you were sort of touching on with that, that EMIS um, purchase, um, and this is a kind of vertical integration. Um, mm-hmm. So this is where um, companies might control um, different parts of um, a process of delivering a product. So in healthcare, this might be different parts of the patient journey. Um, and that actually by integrating these parts, you can make the patient journey smoother and you can make it more efficient. Again, you don't have to use private companies you know, to, to do this. You know, the NHS can collaborate and do this without that. Um, you know, but if you have um, strong links between the primary care provider that's doing a referral, you know, yep. the people who are receiving and processing that referral, people who are um, delivering the secondary care, perhaps even the people who are looking at the data, that helps make the whole thing work, that are setting up the infrastructure and the IT that made the whole thing work. Am I describing an IC, an ICS or ICB here? Is that what you're smiling? You're describing an integrated care system, Andy. <laughs> I am, which is what we're all aiming for, aren't we? Um, uh, but I think, obviously, private what the systems to be aiming for. Let's clarify yeah, that. Yeah. And you are not aiming for that. We are not controlling that. We have no abilities to make that happen in, uh, in a national scape. But yeah, it seems like that's what the system is looking towards. Yeah, goodness me, I wonder if they'll bring in private companies to run a whole ICS. Oh, would they, how would they do that? <laughs> Fine now, shall we? Um, but the last positive point I think to talk about is the impact this can have on staff. So often when you talk about private providers, there's often the, you know, the well-being of the staff that's brought into scope of this. And, and in terms of a positive light, you know, there's the general view that if you work for private companies, you either have more benefits either direct in terms of financial compensation or perks, you know, in terms of other services. So often, you know, particularly in private healthcare, um, people talk about having access to private healthcare, you know, having things like Bupa or other kind of providers um, supporting you, um, uh, you know, other kind of perks in terms of uh, working conditions or other aspects and stuff. And, you know, there is this view that private companies generally are thought to be probably slightly better looking after their staff. Maybe. Maybe I think this cuts. I think this probably cuts both ways, both ways, Gandhi, because a lot of people will the negatives, private yeah. companies really uh, squeezing their profit margins, and one of the ways they can do that is to um, get staff doing more for less. That might it could be short sighted at the company, but but some people will say that, that some companies might behave in that way, and I think also it depends on um, where you are in that company and what job you're doing. So mm. kind of high skill, high demand workers, you know, might find that being offered private healthcare to work in a private healthcare company or stock options or enhanced um, payment and remuneration. Um, Mm -hmm. But if you're in uh, an area that's maybe easier to recruit to with more staff churn, lower training requirements, um, you know, like maybe doing domiciliary type things or lower level admin, I don't know. I wonder if if, even in the same organization, you might find you're not treated quite as well, but I don't know. I think that cuts a number of ways. Um, so, because obviously you and I both work in the health tech space in some way, you know, in terms of what we do and stuff. And one of the things that often comes to me is advertisements for people, you know, companies, particularly private companies, wanting medically trained individuals to help manage their stuff. So clinical director roles, that kind of stuff that, that come to me all the time. And it's interesting when, when I look at the job offers and just in terms of what they're asking for, you know, very much 37 and a half hours a week pay that's equivalent to what i'm already earning as a partner you know and potentially even more sometimes and so many perks when you look at it, you just think why on earth am i doing what i'm doing you know i can get so much more for doing a lot less than what i'm currently doing um why would i not do that why would i yeah. not do that andy yes you haven't so yeah. uh so so there's a story there um yeah. 
So again, some of the transition to the negatives, do you think? Yeah, so some of the negatives. Um, I guess the big fear people have, people have, I guess, is um, is um, at profiteering, and that might be too strong a word, but that the objective of private companies is to make money for their shareholders and you know mm-hmm. increase the, the 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 value of the shares or return um, money to shareholders with dividends or share buybacks or other mechanisms that they return value to shareholders, um, and that that takes money out of the system that could be uh, used to provide more or better healthcare. You know, and that's a concern that, that people have. I guess the companies will say they're going to be more efficient than the mm-hmm. nationalized, you know, socialized providers. And that's where that's coming from. They're delivering more and they're delivering the profit for the shareholders. Um, but uh, other people will say, you know, uh, quality uh, and quantity of healthcare may be squeezed in order to deliver shareholder value. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think about that? I think it's important we take the emotion out of that statement and stuff. So often when people see that, they think that the private delivery people, so the staff or even the the, the people running the companies, their only view is on profit. And that's not necessarily the case. But it's important to remember that one of the main drivers of a private healthcare business is to make profit, to continue the business. Because if they don't, then they don't continue. And then that's self-defeating, isn't it? So... I think it's important in some ways to Im- remove the emotion from that statement that sometimes happens because often that's where a lot of the angst and, and you know negative aspects against private healthcare providers come from. But it is the main driver that they have to compete with, otherwise they don't continue. Whereas you could argue in um, a socialized state that people will continue to put money into um, an organization that is delivering socialist aims because it's accepted that if it makes a loss, actually its services providing is in compensation to the loss itself. And is that how we view the NHS? Because often more and more funds are put into the NHS, but people say, okay, well, it does a great job, you know, in terms of what it can do. And at times it's amazing and it's life-saving. But then also is the NHS itself as an entire organization just something we're putting money into because actually it will never make a profit because it will never make a profit. Let's be clear on that. The NHS will never, ever make a profit. What do you think, Andy? Yeah, well, the the health service in the United Kingdom will will never make a profit as long as it's underfunded. I mean, you you could I mean, if if we were all prepared to spend you know twenty percent of GDP on mm-hmm. on healthcare, you know, something more similar to the US, then there might be space for, for right, somebody yeah. to make a profit. Right, yeah. But, but we'd all be paying for that through paying for more for our healthcare, yeah. uh, and that may not be desirable to us. Um, yeah, and I guess so. Some people, some some people who work in organisations will say, actually, you've got an outdated view of capitalism there, and actually, that's um, old-fashioned Milton Friedman um, shareholder capitalism you know, that mm-hmm. you're talking about. And actually, there's a new kid on the block, and people talk more about stakeholder capitalism. And this is the idea that companies actually exist not just to serve their shareholders, uh, but to serve uh, their other stakeholders, which are their workers and their customers mm-hmm. as well, um, and that. Um, Com- many companies these days are fashioning themselves in that way and uh you know delivering trying to deliver value for everybody not just the shareholders um so um i, I i'm i think stakeholder capitalism works for some companies <laughs> some companies it's often mm-hmm. those who, who benefit from having that kind of image um and i, I think actually the kind of the fundamental ownership structures drive the ultimate behaviors when push comes to shove so i'm not quite sure that that would stand up to um uh you know a lot of uh pressure i don't know what do you think about that gandhi do you believe these companies when they talk about having broader aims and objectives i think you need to look at their structure to understand that completely um i think you know just assigning yourself to that we have you know um altruistic aims and stuff absolutely there are definitely companies that do that and work with that and, and do it effectively um, but I think it always comes down to structure in my personal view, because like you said, it comes down to who's the main benefit. Is it the individual stakeholders and it's actually, that's how it is. Or is it like you say, stakeholder capitalism where there's potentially other benefits in it. And if that's the case, then I'd argue one of the stakeholders has to be the patients and how do they ensure that patients are a genuine stakeholder in that organization then? Yeah, it comes down to ownership, I think. And if, you know, mm-hmm. if you've got kind of a, a founder owned or controlled organization, or there's a narrow group of owners who can um, get around that kind of um, uh, altruistic objective, I think that that works. I think if you're talking about really, yeah. really big, traditionally structured companies, I think they're probably going to skew towards the, the old shareholder capitalism 
model. Um, Earlier we talked about staff um, and the positives. I guess the negatives, you alluded to it briefly in terms of it potentially depends on where in that organization you may be. But also remembering that private healthcare providers generally are looking at the bottom line. So they will try and get as much benefit out of that worker, shall we say, as they can. Would you say that's right? I think so. Um, unless... Um unless prevented to by uh you know by regulation controlling how you treat your workers or you know how you provide mm. your service um um I, yeah i don't know but i think that's definitely a risk with increased private ownership um uh, the other the other negative i would ask the question what can go wrong you know have things gone wrong when we've involved private organizations within healthcare uh before and i think the answer is probably some things have gone wrong. Uh, maybe in focusing on that, we we neglect to look at where things have gone gone right. So I do appreciate mm -hmm. that as we're making this statement. Um, but uh, you know, there was a lot of private money that went into building um, hospital buildings and uh, primary care and joint service centres um, uh, some time ago, um, and uh, a lot of the organisations that now rent and work within those spaces have struggled to meet the costs mm -hmm. because uh, that private investment, you know, is looking for a return. Uh, I know one of the local hospital trusts, um, I, I, I think they nearly went bust or they might've actually gone bust um, up in Mansfield, um, largely because of their building costs around their nice shiny hospital that does look great mm -hmm. like, relative to their own. It, it's nice, but it's very expensive. And, you know, GP mm -hmm. surgery struggle with rent yeah. and costs, management costs. Yeah, Gandhi's surgery, my surgery were in PFI buildings and, um, you know, some of the rent and charges can 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 be um, uh, astronomical. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, things can go wrong. And I, I remember um, there was the issue around um, hip replacements as well. Um, that uh, That's just emblematic of uh, something that yeah. can happen where um, a lot of investment was made to bring in private companies to, um, to be sort of like hip factories and do replacement hips. Um, and some people argue that what happened was that simple places went simple cases um you know people who don't have that many comorbidities you know anticipated to be a fairly yeah. simple operation were done in these centers at a certain tariff um a certain cost to the nhs and actually the nhs providers were left being paid a similar tariff to do the much more complicated um surgeries on people who are sicker with more comorbidities and that ultimately was more expensive and subsidized the work that the private companies were being paid for so so yep. things can go wrong and there were some examples right. of general practice you know when and babylon first started there was this view very much held that babylon was trying to uh, attract the more working well population the the lower complexity elements mm -hmm. of stuff by taking those consultations and those patients that were more happy to do it through remote mechanisms so therefore they were able to deliver care more cost effectively for lower complexity based cases, whereas the practices around those Babylon based practices were, were basically attracting then as a result of that, the more complex patients that required more time, more investment, but actually got the same amount of money. So therefore it wasn't equivocal or effective and stuff. And, and you know, I, I know I'm, I'm mentioning Babylon, but actually any digital providers would fit into that. And actually a lot of private providers would do the same because of the models that they potentially looked at. And, and there has been clear evidence of some of that. But it doesn't mean it, that's how all operators work and stuff. Oh, absolutely. Um, Gedi, I've got a question for you. Is it, mm -hmm. Does it matter where the company comes from? Um, because sometimes a lot of the headlines we see is US healthcare giant, um, you know, comes in. And, and, and I wonder mm -hmm. if we get more worried when it's more from the US. I think about the EMIS um, situation, you know, okay, yep. US healthcare giant buys EMIS. But you know, EMIS was already a, you know, medium sized, you know, UK owned private company, mm -hmm. um, already a private company. So, so does it matter? where the ownership is i think conceptually it does whenever it's american they always stay u.s based you know american based it's always in there in the headline and stuff whereas if it's another provider they tend not to focus on the location and the example i'm going to give you is a uh, digital provider libby which is european based um, and has d done some amazing work and, and continues to do work in, in the uk and stuff um but a lot of people don't realize that their parent company is you know european externally based from the uk and stuff so that hasn't hit the big headlines like all these other companies tend to do and stuff and i wonder if it is because of the view that the american healthcare system has and you know in some ways it has its positives and in some ways it absolutely has its negatives and there's always been this worry that the uk ends up moving towards an american-based healthcare system because there is really you know emotive stories that come out of that and stuff and, and i think um you know 
that's why the geography does have an impact, whether it's genuinely an impact and stuff. Actually, I don't have the evidence to prove that, but I think many people would feel that it's probably not what people want until they find out about it. Yeah, I think people often have the opinion that, you know, American capitalism maybe is different to European capitalism, that the shareholders mm -hmm. have different expectations. Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm not really qualified to comment mm -hmm. on that. But it's just a, a, a difference that I'd noticed, you know, in terms yeah. of how companies are talked about. So I guess we can probably start to to round things up, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having had the discussion, Gandhi, any any observations perhaps leading up to even venturing an opinion um, on this quite controversial topic? So first of all, it is muddy and it is controversial. We can accept that, I think. I think from my perspective, what I would say is that one of the concerns I always do have and will continue to have with um, completely separate private healthcare providers coming in, especially into the general practice space, is what is the model of delivery that they're looking at? I think as long as it's patient-centered and sensible, whether they make a profit or not, in my view, is almost irrelevant because then they can see if they're doing it well and they're doing it effectively, fine. But if it ends up being a service that is using... Um, different skilled people to try and do the lowest bottom line activity and stuff. That's where it tends to fall down. And unfortunately, that's the perception many people have when it comes to private providers coming in. So it comes down to the ethos. It comes down to the involvement. It comes down to the service provision and how does that look and feel? So, yeah, it's muddy is my word. What do you think, Andy? <laughs> Gosh, absolutely. Um, it's really muddy. It's difficult to I think there are sort of pros and cons and, and there's a reality that that what we're doing at the moment in primary care doesn't feel like it's working. So I can understand why you know everybody is searching for alternatives. And there is a problem with the the partnership model that we have. And I think um, it may continue to work for some, but for mm -hmm. many, we're going to be moving towards different ownership models and we need to know what that looks like. And it, you know, it might be state ownership with NHS Trust coming in and running primary care, you know, as the Department of Health, you know, maybe... Uh, leaning towards you know it may be private ownership but we need to do something different um i think that how um the companies and the markets and the services are commissioned and regulated and how the contract management is executed will be really 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 important um mm -hmm. you know, what kind of watchdogs and um you know off health or you know or, you know whatever we have in place you know those structures will be really important if we go down that private model and i think the the structure and the ownership of companies involved in healthcare is important. And I wonder if um, that's something that could also um, be regulated. You know, you can uh, engage in healthcare in the UK, but, you know, there are certain rules about how you structure behave. I don't know. Um, at the end of the day, I think private companies probably do have a, do have a role, um, have a role to play. I'm really sticking my neck out here. Um, if anything, I think what, is often healthy is to have a, a you know a mixed environment with different types of players you know they compete you know they're competing yeah. for the staff they're competing for the patients they're competing to provide services that are good enough to meet the contract requirements and all you know in that competitive environment feels like it's good for value for money and good for the patients so i think that's a bit of a cop out to say you know maybe it's it's healthy to have a mixed environment and let the let let the you know, set the rules in the right way that meets the values of the population of the country and that's you know, the key the thing. Best win. <laughs> yeah i think that's the key thing Annie, because one of the companies we haven't talked about which actually is one of the, probably the biggest issues many people have with private companies coming into is in terms of when companies don't deliver on what they're meant to be doing and if we look at capita and the psc <laughs> P pcse issues and stuff um and that's a, a clear example where private industry has come in to take over a service and actually hasn't delivered in any way shape or form what they were meant to have done and has caused so many problems as a result of it but actually contractually they're still yeah then the government re, the government renew their contract and i think that's where some of this emotion comes that they've had a, a massively damaging impact on general practice on healthcare in the uk um the contract has been extended fair enough whatever reason that's happened but, but what are the processes involved in terms of making sure that they're still not making a stinkingly huge profit on that workload? Because they have, you know, in terms of the profit that Capita has made from its NHS contracts, is, is I think something like 50% of their income comes from NHS contracts. So why are they making a profit when they're failing? Is it that those contractual terms are, are not reviewed enough to the point where it allows for appropriate investment in the service delivery to ensure happens versus profit? And I think 
that's we didn't talk about it. We probably should have done. Apologies, everyone <laughs> missed that one um, in terms of reviewing it. But this is an important point where you need to let us know what you think. So absolutely tell us what you think. Stick it down in the comments below. Let us know what your thoughts are on this because we would love to hear more from all of you. And absolutely, if you want to actually specifically tell us, definitely use our SpeakPipe model. So this is um, www.speakpipe.com slash EGP learning with the G and the P and EGP learning being capitals. And you can tell us specifically what you're thinking and stuff. If not, if you just want to write it down, stick it in the chat in the in the comments and stuff. And we will be really keen to hear on this and share this with other people so they can be aware of this debate. Because actually it is a debate. It's it's a discussion that needs to happen, I think. Um and Andy's shaking his you know nodding his head and stuff. I'm nodding and my head. I think Eddie, it's 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 astonishing. I think we're we're, we're both probably in a different place that we were mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, and, and and maybe the country is as well. And I also hope that we've not offended anybody or offended any of our colleagues in anything we've said. I think we've been mm -hmm. so absolutely. Let us know what you think. And as always, if you do have any comments or questions, let us know. And we're here to help take and answer your primary care and learning. And we'll catch you in the next episode.